If you take your Bibles and turn to Exodus 33, uh, we're going to share, I'm going to read a couple scriptures with you, and I want to unpack a couple things to you. Last night we talked about, in fact, Sunday we talked about how if you want to know God's plan, you have to first know God, God's ways. And then last night we talked about how if you want to know God's ways, sometimes you got to get up in God's face. you got to go toe-to-toe and face-to-face with God so that you can learn about who he is. And tonight I want to talk to you a little bit more about how God, what, how God brings transformation through individuals after, that are, have been transformed. How you get up in God's face, you get transformed, but you become a transformer. And this encounter we're going to read, usually when you think about Moses, don't you think about the burning bush or the Red Sea or, you know, one of those big moments? This is actually the, the most transformative moment in Moses' life. Yes, the burning bush took him from being a shepherd to being a deliverer, took that rod that was a shepherd's rod and turned it into a miracle working rod. I understand that that was powerful. I understand parting the Red Sea was powerful because it was the distinction where they got out of Egypt and then they got passed through and they got into that, that uh, wilderness, you know, a freedom. But this is actually a moment in this encounter we're going to read. Listen to the things that came out of this conversation with God. One conversation with God brought about such societal, personal transformation and societal transformation through Moses that it brought about these things that we still hold valuable. This conversation we're about to read released ideas about representative government, judicial reform, nutritional safety, personal property rights, compassionate monetary policy, common sense and caring immigration policy, groundbreaking architecture, creative fashion design, homeopathic medicine, interior decorations, just war theory and warfare capabilities, freedom of speech, religious expression, sustained family structure. This conversation touched all these parts of society, arts, sciences, education, government, family, faith, and business. One encounter with God transformed, and, and many of the things that happened out of this encounter, we still hold valuable. If it wasn't for this in, in, encounter with God, there was no culture up to that time that valued personal property rights until that nation was born and be through this encounter with God. So here's what I want to say to you, that there are huge problems that we sometimes deal with in our relationships and our, and our families. There, there, there are cultural problems that we think are unsurmountable. There are things, and just think about the things, the number of things, if you look at the news, school shootings and racial injustice and, and war and terrorism and those kinds of things. Well, I believe that all it takes is one person one person that's willing to get up in God's face. One person that's able to seek God's face. One person that's able to hear from God. And sometimes it's the person who's been repressed. Do you know Moses was we marked for destruction, but God marked him for distinction. Sometimes God chooses the people that are most unlikely, most uncharacteristic, most, most unpicked people. I was, I was um, doing um, some writing a, a few years ago. And there was a statement, it was actually for the book that I talked about, there was a statement that I wrote down while I was doing some writing, and it was this. All it takes is one person to hear from God, and they can change the world. And I wrote that statement down, and then I said, I don't believe that, prove it to me. It was as if I was getting up in God's face challenging him. And immediately I heard the Holy Spirit say to me, Harriet Beecher Stowe, look it up. Google, in fact, I think what the Holy Spirit said was, Harriet Beecher Stowe, Google it. <laughs> Why? Because sometimes you have to ask God a question you've never asked before before you get an answer you've never had before. And sometimes we're waiting for God to talk to us and tell us something, and he's just waiting for us to ask because he said, ask and you'll receive. Seek and you'll find. Knock and the door will be open. That was the story of Moses getting up in God's face. So I actually did a little research. I mean, Harriet Beecher Stowe lived just a, a few miles up from my house, outside of Hartford, the Harriet Beecher Stowe house. A museum is there, and I've driven up there many times. Uh, powerful. Harriet Beecher Stowe was the daughter of a pastor, Lyman Beecher. He had five sons and one daughter. All five of his sons became pastors. Harriet Beecher Stowe wanted to be a preacher. That's what she wanted to be. But in her day, culture told her women can't preach. Women had to raise the kids, go to church, and be quiet. 
And so she did the next best thing. She married a preacher. <laughs> I don't think that's the next best thing, but ask Pastor Lisa. Maybe she'll tell you. So anyway, <laughs> so she has these children. She brings them to church on a Sunday. And the pastor's preaching a message, and he quotes the scripture. As much as you've done it to the least of these, you've done it unto me. And her biography, her son writes to her biography, says, and at that moment, she had a vision. And she saw the picture of the slaves and how they're being treated. And the entire vision, she was caught up so much so that she actually had to catch herself from crying out in church because she was supposed to be quiet in church, in her Presbyterian church in, in New York City. And so she went home that afternoon. And in one day, she wrote a book that President Lincoln said changed the world, that launched this great war, a book that's required reading and in countries around the world right now, that addressed an issue that no one else addressed successfully. And God used a woman who was told she couldn't be a voice for God to be a voice for God. A woman who they took away a pulpit and God gave her a pen. Here's what I want to say to you. They could take away your pulpit, but they can't take away your pen. They could take away your platform, but they can't take away your heart. And, and I want to say to you, Moses is a guy who just went after God and asked questions. And I believe that, well, I'm sitting in the company of transformers, people that will write songs that have never been sung before, people that will start businesses like have never been started before, people that will, will bring change to education that's never been brought before. Why? Because I, I believe I'm, I'm sitting in the company of people that are going to learn to access God's thoughts. And so let's take a look at this. We're going to look at verses 18 through 23 of Exodus 33. This one encounter really saw those things I talked to you about. Here's what it says. Then Moses said, now show me your glory. Now, we have to understand why he said, now show me your glory, because he was in the midst of a transition in his, in his leadership. Uh, the people had messed up pretty badly, and he wanted to know who God was going to send with him. And if you listen to our messages that we talk, it wasn't about where God was taking them or what God was going to do, but who was going to go with them. And until you answer the question who, you'll never answer the question where and what. Until you understand it's more about who God is and who he's making you into than where he's taking you and what he's what he's called you to do you see because if you don't know who you are and who God is you can never get to where God's taking you you know a GPS can only get you to your destination if it if it knows your location did you ever turn off your location services and then you try to find your favorite restaurant I did that once I I have I know I have a go-to place that I know I can always get good buffalo wings if I, no matter where I am in the country, it's Buffalo Wild Wings. You know? and, I, and I believe as, as soon as I say to Siri, find Buffalo Wild Wings. It's as if the scent of mango habanero just fills my car. You know what I'm saying? Because I can smell the wings because I know that's where I'm going. And that's where you know you're on your way to your destiny, when you can smell it, when you can taste it, right? And I, and I got off the plane once. I had turned off my location service. I said, find nearest Buffalo Wild Wings, and the thing just spun around like that. And then it ha comes up, no location found. Why? Because the phone, the, the GPS can't get you to your destination if it doesn't know your location. And the same way is that you cannot get to your destiny if you don't know your identity. You can't get to your destiny if you don't know who your God is. When you know who God is and you know who you are, then it doesn't really matter where you're going because if he's with you, you're going to get there all right, right? We'll get there when we get there. I said it Sunday morning. And so what we have here is this situation where Moses is saying, now show me your glory because I need to see who you are. And God says this, and the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you. And I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no one can see me and live. And then the Lord said, listen to this. There is a place near me where you may stand on a rock. And when my glory passes by, I will put you in the cleft of the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove my hand, and you will see my back, but my face must not be seen. And then the Lord begins to 
describe all the things that I told you about that God begins to describe what he wants to do in this nation, the things and the wisdom that God released to Moses about the religion, not just their religious um, experience and their religious expression, but family expression, government expression, sciences and the art, and all these things came out of this one simple question. Now, show me your glory. Have you ever prayed a prayer and then later on you try to take it back? <laughs> Have you ever found yourself in a situation saying, hey God, what am I doing here? Get me out of this jam. And it seems like heaven's not listening to you. If you ever pray a prayer that you don't get an answer to, it may be that you prayed a prayer that got you into that place. Therefore, God's not listening to your second prayer. He's listening to your first prayer. Sometimes the situation we're in is because we prayed a prayer back here that we wanted to know God more. And so God created the circumstance to get to know him more. See, God doesn't always give you the answer that you expect, but he does create the circumstance that make you ask the questions he wants you to ask. And so Moses prayed this prayer. Now show me your glory. Be careful what you pray for. God's listening. Lord, I want to know you in the power of your resurrection. That's what the Apostle Paul said. And share in the fellowship of your suffering and be made conformable to your death. You can't know the resurrection until you're dead. <laughs> I want to know you're the power of the resurrection. Good. Just die. <laughs> You know, what does that mean? It doesn't literally mean God's going to kill you so that he can resurrect you. What it means is if you want to experience something about God you've never experienced before, what you knew about him in the past or thought you knew about him might have to die. Let me put it a simpler way. Sometimes in order to learn new things, we have to unlearn old things. Right? Right? I used to always think I had to work hard to please God. God wanted me to be a good boy and a good Christian. He called me to be a good boy and a good Christian, and he called me into the ministry. It wasn't until June 26, 1997 in Pensacola, Florida, when God called me out of a service, and the pastor said, and son, God's going to use you to do this, 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 this. And he expressed these grand things that I was going to do, but I didn't hear any of those things until later when I got the recording of it to listen to it because all I heard for the first time in my Christian life, and I was a Christian from the time I was five years old, was God called me son. He wasn't just calling me to be a good boy. He wasn't just calling me to be a Christian. He wasn't just calling me to the ministry. And if he called me son, he can certainly get me to the places where he's going to take me because it's not about where I'm going. It's about who he is. He's my father and who I am. I'm his son. And if that's the case, everything's going to work out just fine. You with me? Yeah. All right. And so Moses prays this prayer. Now show me your glory. And God invites him into this place. In fact, there's a hymn that we used to sing in the church. My dad was a song leader in the Wesleyan church that I went to. And we used to sing this song. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock, and he covers me there with his hand. <laughs> Anybody remember that hymn? It always went up like this, and my dad's hand would always go, hand. <laughs> it's a beautiful song. In fact, they, for some reason, I don't know why, they were singing at funerals a lot. <laughs> he hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock. He covers me there. And it sounds beautiful, but it's about this story right here. Here's what God says. There's a place near me where you may stand on a rock. What's that sound like? It sounds like a promotion. Well, God, you're going to use me. You're going to sh I ask you to show me your glory. Now you want me to stand on a rock near you? I'm in. I'm all over it. Let's do it. And when my glory passes by you, I will put you in the cleft of the rock. Oh, beautiful. Isn't that beautiful? He's just going to hideth your soul. Sounds so much better when you say it in the King James, too. <laughs> hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock. 
and he covereth me there with his. You know what that really means in like not King James, like straight up Philly talk? <laughs> hey, yo, Moses, get over here. <laughs> you see the hole in the rock right there? Why don't you go inside? <laughs> what happened? Who turned out the lights? God covers the only exit to the hole in the rock when Moses goes inside. Literally, here's what the, what the song should say. When I want to know him more, he puts me in a hole. Daddy shuts the door. <laughs> you should write that song. It would be awesome, man. It could be like an angst kind of metal song, you know. <laughs> Get me out of here. Get me out of here. <laughs> because that's the next prayer Moses prayed after show me your glory. What's the next prayer? Get me out of here, God. Get me out of here. And God's like, na 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 na. I can't hear you. <laughs> Why? Because He's not going to answer the second prayer. He's going to answer the first prayer. God, I want to know You in the power of Your resurrection. Are you sure? <laughs> because Moses, no man can see my face and live. And that means if I want to see God in a new way. There's something about the old way I saw him that has to die. That sounds like super scary preacher talk. So let me say it again. If you want to learn something new, sometimes you've got to unlearn some things you've learned. And sometimes in order to unlearn things, it's painful. Because the first thing we realize is, I've been stupid. <laughs> There's some stuff I didn't understand. You see, I thought God was mad at me. And God was pleased with me. I thought God was punishing me. But God was promoting me. And in fact, here's what I want to tell you. Sometimes God's ways are this. What looks like punishment is really a promotion. It's all about your perspective. What looks like a downgrade is really an upgrade. It's all about your perspective. Perspective is huge because if we understand it's God's nature, it's his way to increase us. So he's saying, you want to see me? You want to know me? There's a place near me where you can stand on a rock. And sometimes the circumstances of our life look the opposite from what God is really doing. And if we believe about God, if we don't unlearn the things about God that we've learned in the past, we won't learn the new things. I can remember the first time in uh, my new ministry after I pastored uh, and I started traveling and I started to do things internationally. The first, I, I did, I prayed that prayer as a kid. Lord, send me to the nations. Ask of me, I'll give you the nations as an inheritance. Here am I, Lord, send me to the nations. I prayed those prayers. And you know what? I, I said, Lord, I'll go anywhere you want. Send me to the hard places. You know the first nation God sent me to? 2006, Italy. Hallelujah for missions. I'll take that all the time. Lord, here am I. Send me to Africa. Here, I use reverse psychology on God. Send me to Africa, Lord. Okay, I'll send you to, I'll send you to Europe. That's awesome. <laughs> and I went, I remember going to this first mission trip I did in Italy. And it was a long trip. It was like two weeks. It was, a, it was a beautiful time. In fact, it was the first time I felt God spoke to me for a nation, like a word to, to give a nation. And that it was a very unusual experience. I was getting ready. It was about two weeks before my trip, maybe 10 days. I can't remember the exact timing. And I was sitting down. I had my, my laptop with me. And I had just flipping the channels. It was on ESPN or something like that on the TV. I was preparing a sermon, watching ESPN. God wasn't offended by it. He's all okay. And it happened to be the World Cup preliminaries. And it was the Italian soccer team, and they were playing against Australia. I remember. And I remember looking up and going, oh, this is the World Cup. And so I wonder what, how long the World Cup is. And I looked up the schedule, and it turns out that the final game of the World Cup, the finals, was going to be played the weekend that I was going to be in Italy doing my first international conference I've ever done. And I got this idea, I don't know why, because of the way that I think, that that would mess up my conference if Italy was playing soccer while I was doing the conference in Italy. So I prayed a prayer. I said, God, let Italy lose. Don't let them get into the finals. Now, I didn't know anything about soccer. They weren't supposed to get into the finals at all. And immediately, I had this picture, and I saw the Brazilian World Cup soccer team carrying the trophy 
World Cup trophy, and they handed it to the Italian soccer team. And I'm sitting there in my living room with my laptop and the TV on. The Holy Spirit said to me, Italy's going to win the World Cup this year. And it's a sign that a revival, like a revival in Brazil and South America, is going to come to Italy. And I'm like, oh, I don't know if I believe that or not. I'm, how do I know? But here's what I do know. They're, if they're not in the finals when they go to Rome next, in a couple weeks, I don't even have to tell them what I, what I was thinking because they won't know I was wrong. So I go there. By the, one time, by the time I get there, it's proven Italy's going to play in the final. That Sunday night, I get there on a Friday. That Sunday night, Italy is scheduled to play France in the final game of the World Cup. Now I'm psyched because I actually heard from God watching ESPN. Hallelujah. I mean, I don't think you can hear from God watching the news, but you can hear from God watching ESPN. I know that for sure. So I get up boldly on Friday night. I tell you, I'm the honest truth. I get up boldly on Friday night. God gave me a word for your nation, gave me a word for your, for your city. You're going to win the World Cup this Sunday, and it's a sign that revival is coming from Brazil to Italy because God's going to bring revival to Italy. They started screaming before I said anything about revival. I said, you're going to win the World Cup, and they went, Wah! crazy. You know, I immediately realized this. Wait a second. Like, this isn't like a hit-and-run prophecy. This is good, like hit and stay, right? So I'm going to be here, and they don't even have to judge the word. They're going to judge the prophet if the word doesn't come true. And this is a city where stoned a lot of Christians. So I'm thinking <laughs> they could pick up these ancient Roman stones and do some damage to me. And my skin bruises easily, so I was a little worried. So Sunday night, we get there, and they are all in. They're all wearing their soccer shirts. They have their flags. We did not have worship. We had pregame warm-up. They're just going for it. And so I get up and preach the message. I actually preach the message. You already won the battle. You already win the game. That's <laughs> I decided, hey, if you're in, you might as well go all in. <laughs> and then I tried to exit out the back door, but the pastor said, no, we have food for you here. He <laughs> said, you can eat in my office, which was by the back door. So I figured it's safer to be by the back door just in case. So I'm eating my good Italian meal. They're all watching the game. There's still about 200 people that hung around after the meeting to watch the game, blasting it over the sound system of the church. And they're around the TV watching the game. And I could hear them scream from time to time, but I'm just eating pasta. I'm all good. So I get a bang on the door. You need to come. They're kicking the penalty kick. I opened the door. I said, what's a penalty kick? It's the end of the game. They're, they're tied. So I go out there, and they're watching. Now France and Italy are going to take turns kicking these penalty kicks. So they're all around the TV like this because they believe Italy's going to win. And I'm behind them. They can't see me. And I'm like this. Oh, Jesus, please. <laughs> if you never answer another prayer, I ever pray in my life. And I heard it, my eyes were closed. I was on the ground interceding. Kind of like Elijah, the story where he put his head between his knees seven times. Oh, God. <laughs> and I hear a scream, and they win, and they look at me. We won. I said, of course. You didn't believe me? What are you kidding? <laughs> so I had a, great, had a great trip, and I, was, I had to, went to another couple cities. I'm coming back, and here's what I want to tell you about the cleft of the rock. Sometimes you feel like you're in a cave, but where you really are is on a place of promotion. Sometimes you feel like God's punishing you for a prayer that you pray, but what he's doing is he's rewarding you. It's just you have to see the promotion when it looks like demotion. You have to see the rock where there's a cleft in the rock. And so I'm on my way back. As long I was coming from the, the mountains from the north, I had to take a train, then I had to take a plane, then I had to take a, another train, and then I had to take another plane. So I finally got or another train that got to Rome. It took me 12 hours to get to the airport in Rome. We're ready to get in my flight from Rome to New York. And <clears throat> I get there, and when I get to the gate, they said, there's going to be a delay. And I was flying, like, not my regular airline. In fact, I didn't have a regular airline then, to be honest with you. I just was flying at El Italia. And people were upset. People were angry. People were complaining. I was hot and sweaty. I, I wasn't feeling very good. Didn't feel like I had the favor of God. I'm like, come on, God. I mean, I gave this word for this nation, and now I have to wait here, and I'm all hot and sweaty. And I saw this older couple <clears throat> walk away from the gate and away from the crowd. And I, for some reason, I was just curious watching them. And so I decided to follow them because they weren't complaining and they weren't angry. So sometimes if you want to get a new perspective, find somebody who's not angry. Maybe you just 
get a perspective from them. So they walk up to an elevator, and I didn't notice when they hit the button, but the sign in the elevator said executive level club, upper level, or executive club, upper level. And they get in the elevator, and for some reason, I walked in the elevator with them. I didn't have a plan. Well, I got in the elevator, I'm like, oh, they could look like my parents. I don't know. I don't know why I'm formulating this plan in my head, like maybe I could pass this with a kid, maybe I'll just silently walk in, maybe God will hide me and I'll just, but I'm in the elevator. And then the, they're looking at me, I smile at them, I say, how you doing? And they start speaking in German, and I don't know any German except like Gesundheit, and I don't know if it's a swear word or not, but anyway. So we get to the executive club and we go, they get to the counter and they show the, their card to the lady at the counter and she says, welcome. And they go in, and then I'm standing there right behind them, and I'm looking at her, and I, I smile. And she says, yes. I said, um, I don't have my card with me because <laughs> I didn't have it with me because I didn't have one. <laughs> and she said, well, I was telling the truth. And she, she said, well, do you have a ticket? And I said, yeah. I pulled it out of my pocket. She said, oh, here's your frequent flyer number. That's your card number. Welcome. I'm like, Thank you. <laughs> I've never been in the executive club. I didn't know everything was free. So I didn't want to like, I figured this is one of those places where it's going to be like five bucks for a cappuccino or, you know, $10 for a Coke. And, and it's like, I can sit here, but I can't afford to drink anything. And then my delay went from 20 minutes to an hour, from an hour to three hours. And I think I was there for over an hour, and I'm seeing all these people eat and drink. So I decided to ask somebody, um, you know, how much does it cost to get a to drink? They're like, they're like, sir, everything's free here. I'm like, it's free? <laughs> like, cappuccino, coffee? Yeah, it's free. Cappuccino's free. I'm like, cappuccino's free? So I was there for three hours. I had like 10 cappuccinos. Cause, because I like free stuff. I told you I like free stuff. And I'm like, oh, I hope this delay. I'm just jacked up on cappuccino at this moment. Like, I'm not angry. I'm not upset about the delays. I'm not upset about not getting home. I didn't realize I'm sitting in a middle seat. I didn't even care. Look at my seat. I'm like, this is great. I got like six, seven, eight hours in the plane. I can watch all three Lord of the Rings movies back to back to back. Because I am awake. I'm just going to be like, cappuccino? My precious, my precious, cappuccino. I'm excited. I'm super excited. Finally, after a three-hour delay, we finally get in our plane. I'm in the center. I'm in the center seat, and I'm literally between two really very blessed people. Their cup is overflowing right onto my seat and everything. And I'm like, isn't this great? This is great. I'm going to watch Lord of the Rings. I'm going to watch all three of them. And they're, like, looking at me like, what are you? I said, did you have the cappuccino? It's really good. <laughs> And I'm sitting there, and I'm not upset about being delayed, and I'm not upset about being in the middle seat, and I'm not upset about this long trip that I haven't, haven't seen my family in two weeks. I'm just so happy. I mean, I'm jacked up on cappuccino for sure, but I'm happy because I was in the executive club, and I didn't even know I could be there. And then my name comes over the speaker, Mr. Hazlett, come, please come to the front. And I thought, oh, this is great. Maybe they're going to give me a cappuccino. <laughs> And the guy goes, sir, you're in the wrong seat. We have a seat for you in first class. I'm like, do you have cappuccino? He's like, yeah. <laughs> and so I got the, that's my first international flight. I got to fly first class. I was like, the guy behind, next to me wasn't happy about it because he knew I never flew because I was so excited. I'm like, this is great. Isn't this great? They have cappuccino. He's, he put his seat back. He's like, shut up. Shut up on your face. I think it was Italian. You know? And I'm sitting there, and the Lord said, you see, whenever you realize that you have the favor of God on your life, doors open for you that would never have opened if you didn't believe it. You know what David said? Yea, though I walk through the valley of shadow death, I fear no evil. Then he ends up saying, goodness and mercy follows me all the day of my life. David is in the cleft of the rock. And what did God say he's going to proclaim over him while he's in there? 
I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. All my goodness will pass before you. Can I tell you something? Sometimes when God promotes you, it looks like you're in a place of darkness, of hiddenness. But where you are is a place where God's goodness is passing by. His mercy is passing by. He's revealing stuff to you he's never revealed for you. And can I tell you something? It's a lot easier to navigate the cleft of the rock when you drink cappuccino. <laughs> I have this saying, every delay turns into an upgrade, because I just refuse to let the circle, I'm not telling you I do it all the time, I'm not telling you my first reaction is, oh, that's great, I just lost $10,000 in the stock market, well, I've never lost $10,000 in the stock market, because I don't have $10,000 in the stock market, but all I'm saying is, it's your perspective, because everything in the kingdom of God is advancing, and when God puts Moses in the cleft of the rock, Something is happening. What is he? He said, when my glory passes by, I'll put you in the cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Everybody say, passed by. You see, something is going on, and here's the good news about God. When God promotes you, sometimes it feels like punishment. But can I tell you something? If you change your perspective, you'll see that goodness is passing by. Mercy is passing by. But also this, sometimes the place that seems the darkest, the place that seems the quietest, the place that seems farthest away from God is actually the place that he's the closest. The reason he puts you in those places isn't because he's trying to keep his voice from you. It's that he's trying to attune your ear to things you've never heard before. If Moses wouldn't have gotten into the silence, he never would have gotten the wisdom and the revelation of all the things that God gave him about the law, about the culture culture, about the family, about the, the, the faith that he had, about the creative arts, the amazing things. I mean, God gave him ingredients for perfumes. That's how detailed God was. They, he said, I want you to make this tabernacle. You didn't just make a building where God would be. He says, there's going to be ladies that are going to make like these perfumes that you're going to anoint the priests with. God is that concerned that when he does things in your, your life, he wants you to smell better. <laughs> it's true. I was reading an article today. <laughs> oh, I don't know why I was reading this article. I found out this new product. I have to try it. It's called pit liquor. Not liquor, like l liquor, but liquor like liquor. These guys... They got tired of having all the chemicals in their deodorant, and so they made deodorant out of whiskey. It's supposed to be all natural. I'm not advocating it. I don't know if it's legal if you're under 21. All I'm saying is I think it's really creative, and the name's really cool, Pit Liquor. <laughs> I know. Everybody's going to get on line right now, and you're going to be looking at it. We're going to have, like, a total, like, order of, of Pit Liquor. God wants you to smell good when you get to your next season. He wants goodness and mercy to follow you, and he doesn't want you to stink like the old season. He did all this stuff for Moses, and Moses is in the dark. Moses is in the silence. And what is God doing? He's passing by. What's happening in your darkest season? God's passing by. What's happening in the, in the season of silence? God's passing by. What's happening when you feel like you're alone? You're the only one that's standing for righteousness and truth. You're the only one that's praying. You're the only one that's doing the right thing. He's passing by. His goodness is passing by. So Moses is on the inside. But here's the better thing. He says, I am passing by. Can I tell you something? When it seems like you're in your darkest moment, God's the closest. When it seems like you're in solitude, God's the closest. When it seems like he's the most silent, God's the closest. In fact, why is it that he's silent? Because if he was so far away, he'd have to shout. But the reason that he's so quiet is he's close enough that all he has to do is whisper. For you to hear. God, I'm in the middle of this. I'm in the cleft of the rock. I'm in this hole. Well, I asked you to show me your glory, and all I could see is the inside of a cave. But Moses, my goodness is passing by. I'll have mercy on whom I have mercy. I'll have compassion on whom I have compassion. You see, sometimes the most breakthrough moments 
come at the darkest time, the time when it seems the most silent, because those are the times where we really tune our ear. We shut other stuff out. Turn off the noise around us. There was a season in my life I turned everything off for almost a, a whole year. No movies, no TV, nothing. The word of God came alive to me. Every day I'd wake up at 5 o'clock just so hungry for God. And, and I, I remember after nine months, the first time I went into a, remember the old Blockbuster video store? Right? I went to a Blockbuster video. I, had, I literally lasted about 30 seconds in Blockbuster. I had to get out because the noise was so loud. The noise of all the, the, the movie, you know, titles and the words. It was, just, it was like I could hear all these movies coming at me at once because I had so desensitized, or so sensitized myself to the voice of God. I'm not saying I don't. I like to watch movies. It's not, it's not a problem for me. I, there's sometimes I do draw away. I take times, two, two times a year. I take 21 days and I shut down all social media, all electronics. Why? Because I want to stay sensitive to the voice of God. What I'm saying is sometimes you'll have experiences where it seems like everything, you're shut away from everything else. It's not that you're shut away. It's that you're shut in with him. And that's the time when you're going to have his thoughts, his words are closer. But watch this. And he says this. Then I will remove my hand, verse 23, and you will see my back. But my face must not be seen. Now, this is just such an interesting passage. And it could sound a little bit confusing. And it's kind of the end of the story. But then, actually, he describes all the things that I talked about at the beginning. They come in the afterward, after Moses gets out. In fact, here's what happens afterward. Moses comes out. He comes down with the Ten Commandments. He comes down with the law. He comes down with the judicial system. He comes down with the architectural plans for the tabernacle. He comes down with the fabric understanding of how to work, the workmanship, the creativity. He comes down with the ingredients for the, for the perfumes. He comes down with the plan for how to build sustainable families, for economic reform, for tithing, and, and taking care of the poor for ideas whenever aliens come into the country, immigrants come into the country, how to take care of them. The year of jubilee, get debt relief, and bank, instead of bankruptcy, all these things. He comes out of the cave with all these ideas. But not just that. When he comes down, his face, he doesn't even know it. His face is shining bright white. And the people are afraid to even talk to him because his face is shining white. And what was his face shining with? The glory of the Lord. What was passing by when he was in the cave? The glory of the Lord. The glory of what, you, what is passing by you when you're in your time of preparation is what is going to be on you when you're in your season of promotion. And I'm telling you, what God is doing on the inside of you right now isn't just going to take you somewhere. It's going to change you into something. You're going to be a different person because you went into the cleft of the rock. You're going to go into the, you're going to be a different person because you allowed yourself to be shut away from the clutter. And do you know while Moses was in the rock, the people didn't understand what was going on. They criticized his leadership, but he was exactly in the place where he was supposed to be. The people didn't understand because they couldn't hear him any, anymore, but he was hearing from God the way he was supposed to hear. And sometimes, as, if we're going to be leaders, we have to be able to stand in a place of solitude, aloneness, so that we can then lead people into a place they've never been. Because if you're not willing to go with God into a place you've never been, you'll never lead anyone else into a place they've never been. And the, I want to be one of those people who's willing to stand with God where many, where very few have stood before so that I can then help people walk into a place they've never been before. And that only happens when you pray dangerous prayers. That only happens when you say, God, show me your glory. God, use me to bring change. God, use me to touch my school. God, use me to transform my city. God, use me to be a better husband, a better father. Use me to be a better mother. Use me to change the, my, the business environment of my office. God, show me your glory. And guess what he says? No one can see my face, but when I remove my hand, you will see my back. Everybody say back. That word actually in the King James, it says my my afterward, my behind parts. And it's, it doesn't literally just mean my back, like God showed him his back. It means 
my after word, the after word of what happens when I pass by, the after word of when my presence passes. Can I tell you something? What you're going through right now is the before, but there comes an after word. And sometimes we give up the word that God has promised us before we get the after word. And if you let you, if you give up your word before you get your after word, then you stay stuck in an old word. But God has an after word, the after word of your faith relationship, the afterword of your, your messed up job, the afterword of the bad decisions you made, the afterword of the abuse you went through, the afterword. And let me tell you something, the devil doesn't get the last word because God has an afterword. The devil doesn't get the last word in your life. And the devil might want to give you a word that your marriage has failed, but God has an afterword for your marriage. And the doctor might want to give you a word about your health, but God has an afterword for the doctor. And guess what? People want to give you a word about who they think you are, but God has an afterword for that. God has an afterword for everything you're going through. And he said, Moses, you're going to see my afterword. And afterward, you're going to look a lot different. And afterward, I'm going to give you a plan for this nation. And afterward, we're going to create something where I can come and live with my people. And afterward, you're going to, you're going to build something that's going to transform history. All from a guy who was a failed leader. All from a guy who was a stuttering communicator. All from a guy who had a bad temper and, and murdered someone. All from a guy who couldn't stand up and take his justice. And he ran away as a fugitive. All from this guy who was marked for destruction. And God said, I mark you for distinction. You see, but let me tell you, many of us find ourselves in this place where we get to that spot where we've prayed a prayer. We find ourselves in a hole in the rock. And God's already moved our, his hand. He's already put the, the glory on our face. He's just waiting for us to step out into the afterward. You see, God could have removed his hand, and if Moses would have stayed in the corner crying about his circumstance, nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Nobody knows my sorrow. I mean, he's in a cave. And to be honest with you, he had a lot of right to complain. He had some leaders who betrayed him, he had some followers who wouldn't follow. He had a lack of resources. He had promises that he had no way potentially to ever see them. It was impossible for this to come to pass. He'd served God. He'd been faithful with God. Even his brother and sister came against him, his natural blood relatives. He could have stayed in the cave and said, you know what? I'm done. I'm going to end it right here. I'm going to stay here in my middle seat. I'm going to stay here and complain that I didn't get the upgrade. I'm going to stay here and complain with the other people at the gate. I'm going to complain about this 20-minute delay. And to be honest with you, I honestly believe if I wanted to follow those people, I would have never been upgraded. I honestly believe God was teaching me a lesson that if you want goodness and mercy to follow you all your days of your life, you got to learn to see goodness and mercy in someone else, and you need to find your way. If you don't have the favor of God in your life, find someone who has the favor of God and follow what they're doing. <laughs> At least fake it till you make it. You know what I mean? <laughs> because you have the ticket and you think you don't have access to these places, but you already have it. You're welcomed into the favor of God. You're welcomed into the goodness of God. You're welcomed into the mercy of God. His goodness is passing by. His mercy is passing by. And all you have to do is... Release the ticket. Oh, take the ticket out of your pocket, and you'll see the afterward. And so Moses comes down the mountain, and his face is shining with the glory of God. And I love the way the Apostle Paul says it in Corinthians, I think it's chapter 3. He said, in the same way that when Moses' face shined, and when Moses is red, there's a veil put over, over his face. He goes, in the same way we're being transformed into his image, from glory to glory. And I believe what God is doing in your life, in my life, what we're going through, what seems like a cave, is actually a, a, an invitation to promotion. What seems like silence is actually an opportunity to hear God's voice in a new way. What seems like the last word is actually turning into the afterword of God. 
Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell on the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Amen. Let me pray for you. Father, in Jesus name, <clears throat> ask the worship team to come. Give us courage to pray dangerous prayers. Give us boldness to go where very few people have gone before. Give us perspective. That no matter <clears throat> what the cave around us looks like, your goodness is passing by. No matter, no matter how dark it may seem, your mercy is passing by. And no matter how much we even get frustrated with ourselves in these moments, <clears throat> your glory isn't just transforming the outside. It's transforming us from the inside out. 